Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this next, uh, well, just under an hour now for this webinar um, hosted by BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT on uh, bridging the digital skills gap. Um, I'm John Higgins. I'm the, it's my privilege to be the president of BCS for this, for this year. Um, I'm not personally involved day to day or in uh, digital skills, but clearly as a, with a career in IT and IT advocacy. I've followed it in various guises over the years. I was a board member of uh, eSkills UK many years ago when that organization existed before it became the Tech Partnership. I co-chaired the EU's Digital Jobs and Skills Coalition for a while and I currently, um, one of my uh, roles is chairing an advisory board for an alliance of European universities, which is great fun. Um, Joining us this afternoon for this discussion, uh, we have with us the Minister for Apprenticeships uh, and Skills, Gillian Keegan. Gillian began her career as an apprentice with a subsidiary of General Motors in Kirby, Liverpool. Good afternoon, Gillian. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Neil Bentley-Gockman uh, is the CEO of World Skills UK, um, an independent charity that I think is one of 86 around the world. Um, and works with employers, education and governments and with a name like Word Skills, World Skills UK, I guess you, we can all understand what your area of focus is. I had the pleasure of working with Neil previously when he was uh, at the CBI where he uh, rose to become the uh, Deputy Director General. Uh, and um, Neil's input this afternoon is partly based on a very informative uh, report that, that they've just produced, Disconnected, uh, the Disconnected Report. Um, and I also have with me a colleague from BCS, Annette Allmark, who's head of apprenticeships um, and uh, has a long experience in, with apprenticeships, not just in the digital field, but I think, Annette, you had um, many years you worked with um, the hospitality sector looking at apprenticeships there, so really does know the apprentices and, and many other aspects of the digital skills challenge um, very, very well. Um, I... As I say, our format's about an hour. I do want to give the um, participants the opportunity to contribute later on, maybe in that, in that final third we'll aim for. And the way I'd like you to do that, if you could, is to use the Q&A box and pose the questions or comments, put comments in there. And then one of our colleagues, Claire, will be monitoring that. And at a point later in the discussion, I'll turn to Claire and ask her, basically, what are you saying? What do you think? What are your questions? Um, and uh, she will give us a sort of synthesis. I think I hope that my um, analysis of the and we now have about 150 participants with us. I, I, I was uh, saying to the panel that I think they will be drawn from BCS membership, our 60 from among the 60,000 or so uh, professionals who work in the digital sector, public sector, private sector, SMEs, large companies. Um, some will be here as employers um, running SMEs or CIOs of uh, large organizations. You'll be some training providers. And I'm sure um, all of us will be looking at this from the point of view of a personal interest. What does it mean for us and our families and our future um, as we look at this digital uh, skills gap and how to bridge it? If I may, what I'd like to do is start with a discussion about that gap. Um, see if we can just drill down into it a little more and see um, what it means. What, you know, are we talking about the gap in basic digital skills or advanced digital skills? And what do we mean by that? Um, let's just get a bit of sort of nuance uh, as to what that gap is and what the problem is that that gap presents to us as a, an economy and society. And indeed, what the opportunity uh, would be if we were to address and, and bridge that bridge that gap. So, you know, what's the what's the problem? What's the prize? And um, Gillian, if I could turn to you first of all, what's the government's analysis of this sort of problem and opportunity? Uh, well, you you asked a question whether it's basic digital skills or it's more um, advanced digital skills, and of course the answer is it's it's all of them, um, and in many many different areas. And in fact, I think there's hardly a job now that isn't really digital at some element at some level um, and not only roles and jobs but actually how we live our lives and one of the things that I think as 
probably accelerated, well, definitely has accelerated during the pandemic, is this reliance on digital skills, particularly when we were all in this extraordinary situation of being, you know, locked down at home, not being able to go out, etc. So the, that, that's brought about, I think, a stark reminder, I think, to, to people have been talking about this for a long time, but it almost suddenly happened overnight to some degree when uh, the pandemic left us with very little but the ability to uh, use things to whether it's you know get your get your shopping delivered or um, speak to your friends or family um, or indeed arrange a medical appointment or advice or whatever so I think it's all levels and not only is it all levels to put it into context it's global and I think that's one of the big uh, challenges that everybody's going to have when you're looking at the skills that you need in a society. First of all, it's the skills, skills that you need to take part in that society. And that's really the basic skills, et cetera, to enable you to partake and how you get the confidence if you are really at the very beginning of that journey to start. And then the second is when you look at how we are going to do well all of us recover from the economy there's a lot of things that we'll all be trying to do at the same time um, building back better building back greener and the fact we're doing that in a digital world that's been transformed to some degree means that there's going to be a global skills shortages of pretty much the same skills so that's the challenge uh, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell as we see it from government uh, perspective Thank you very much. So like, definitely build back better, build back greener. Absolutely. I mean, Neil, what's your analysis uh, taught you that you can share with us? What can we learn from the picture? Sure. So just picking up, picking up where Gillian left off, I mean, this is an economically significant issue for the UK and globally. Um, and this was the starting point for us at World Skills UK doing some research with Ingenuity and the Learning and Work Institute. Um, EY do annual surveys every year of what inward investors are looking for from the UK economy, UK economy, and today they've just published their most recent research. And the digital economy and digital growth is what they are looking for in the UK in terms of investment opportunities. And part of the challenge they've got with us is skills and the supply of digital skills. And so that's why we started looking at this research because World Skills UK is all about global benchmarking on skills and standards. And you know, we need to be attracting that inward investment into the UK and across the UK to create digital jobs. And you know, what um, our skills survey was showing, and it was about a thousand employers and two thousand young people, is this gap, um, you know, three things really. One is the first gap between supply and demand. We've got this huge growing demand from employers, 60% saying they've got, you know, they need more digital skills. 92% need those basic digital skills. So it's things like, you know, proficiency in Word and Excel and PowerPoint, but also they need the advanced digital skills. So that could be specific skills around coding or computer aided design. And, you know, the, the, the gap between that demand and supply is only 18% of the young people that we surveyed feel confident um, about having the advanced digital skills that employers need. So, and we've seen a drop off at GCSE, A-level, you know, and apprenticeships around in young people taking up um, digital um, career routes and, and thinking about digital careers as, as a way forward. And that's, you know, that's, so that supply and demand issue is real for everybody. And that's what, you know, government's trying to address and through the skills by paper, really focusing on that. But there are two other aspects to this. One's a regional issue, which is a lot of the digital careers and jobs markets in London. And that's where a lot of inward investment goes. But the work that we do across the UK, we know that colleges and training providers are driving up the quality of, of training they're giving young people to higher standards but the investment isn't going across the UK. And that's something we've got to look at from a leveling up perspective, looking at how can we you know, really match the supply of young people in colleges, whether it's in South Wales, Glasgow, and Manchester, and get that investment going to where skills are being developed. And the third is a gender issue. There's a big gender gap. Um, lots of young women we spoke to as part of our work were saying, you know, they're not sure, they're not confident, they're not clear what digital careers look like. And so, 
you know, all of these things coming together, I think, creates a big challenge and opportunity for us to do more on helping inform more young people, better careers advice, which we'll be doing, um, you know, more of an our work supported by the Department for Education, but also looking at this international benchmark and you know, making sure we're developing not just the skills supply, but the quality of the skills um, that inward investors need. Um, and again, that's part of the, the government's agenda and the skills white paper, looking at quality of teaching and training and making sure we're giving those young people the best start um, in terms of the training they're being offered, but crucially delivering to employers in the economy, the quality and quantity of skills that are needed. Thank, thank you very much. But Gillian, I don't know if you, I spent my Friday, late Friday evening, watching Newsnight. Probably not the best way to get off to an exciting weekend, but anyway. Um, but I caused a piece by Ken Clark, and um, he, as you might suspect, was a little bit critical about some of government policies. But he said, he said, the best is what we're doing on the future of skills training. I don't know if you caught this, but it's the best, the future of skills training, reskilling, tackling youth unemployment. So a, th a big fan of yours, uh, Gillian, and the policies that you've been developing in this part of government. So do you want to outline those two? I mean, I think you can assume the audience is going to have some basic groups, but you know, tell, put it in your own words. What are the, what are, what's really exciting about the, the policies? What are the things you're most proud of? And, and where would you like most help, you know, as well? Well, actually, I think the most exciting thing, and you, you put it into context there, uh, talking about uh, Ken there, because... Um, you know, I'm very much, I'm uh, very passionate about this uh, agenda. It's one of the main reasons I came into politics after a 30 year career in multinationals uh, all over the world, actually tackling what Neil's been talking about, which is where you invest, who's got the skills, why you invest in what technology, where. Um, but actually I was reading Ken Clark's autobiography and I nearly dropped the book over Christmas because actually what he said in the 90s was exactly what I was saying now. Um, and he was at a different level. He was the education secretary. And I think that what that taught me is actually, and this I, I knew, but it kind of brought it home, was that there's no originality in terms of this idea of what we were trying to do. The difficulty and the, the this key thing is, is the timing right and you know, is it right for everybody to, to try and solve it? Is the timing right to actually address what has been quite a long-standing issue in our country? Um, and sometimes we do it a bit better and sometimes we roll back a bit and you know, there's various initiatives. So I think the thing that I'm most excited about is the timing. The timing is right. And there's been a number of reasons for that. The first is what's been happening in terms of the skills need. And that's largely been driven, I would say, uh, from my business career, uh, probably a, a lot since the internet became this ubiquitous platform. And all of the business model changes pretty much everywhere you look that have been driven by that capability um, and, and what that's done to disrupt businesses and to create new businesses and to create new skills and, and a new paradigm really in terms of you know data being the product in, in many cases etc so that's something that I think is, is, is really the timing's right for that obviously in our own case in the UK you've also got Brexit which again changes how um, you know, how easy it is or how you get uh, skills from abroad. And, and let's be fair, we have been on a bit of a low skills road ourselves and we've been supplementing that by, by attracting skills in from many other countries. And we could do that because we're an attractive place to come. And then you've got the pandemic, which has just accelerated all of these things that really needed to be done. Um, so that's, that's effectively, um, you know, the timing means that hopefully, what's the, what's the key things that we need to do? The first is the culture shift. Uh, working with employers and uh, government really very closely to deliver this uh, organic, dynamic, skills-based uh, education system, which effectively will ensure that you're studying things, the time and effort you put into that, whether it's studying at school, whether it's studying uh, full-time in a classroom, whether it's doing an apprenticeship, whether it's going back and, and, and upskilling via the lifetime skills guarantee, whether it's going to a boot camp, whatever it is you're doing, what you're doing is valuable. You're going to get the skills that are really valuable and will immediately enable you to become valuable in the workplace. And then, of course, once you've got that platform, it's the culture of change in terms of the individual change, this lifetime of learning, this ability to continue to go back to education, this ability for the system to support you to go back to education, to upskill, to reskill, to get some new skills and to lower the barriers, whether it's financial 
or mostly it's confidence. A lot of that is confidence as well, making it bite-sized, making it flexible, making it easy, making it inclusive. So that's the other big culture shift. Now there's a whole load of details around how we're gonna do that, which are in the white paper. But effectively, you know, if we look in X number of years and we look back and say, what is it we're most proud of? It's those two shifts in terms of employers being, of all levels, small, medium, and larger ones, being really involved in defining and leading uh, what 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 this what the things are that people need to be uh, taught in terms of skills and technical education. So that's kind of that's where I'd like to, us to look back and for everybody, everyone to be talking about what course they're doing next and how. But I, I, that's great, Gillian. Let's drill down a little bit into the, this employer and and training provider relation. I remember being on the CBI regional council meetings, Neil, where. We had employers around the table hearing stories of how employers had set their own universities up, as it were, in-house because they didn't feel that the providers were relating to them or giving them the skills. It's a long-standing beef, isn't it? I mean, so, so how do we get employers and training providers uh, to work, you know, recognise each other's drivers, you know, not try to sort of pretend they're not something that they, they, they aren't, but... Um, how do we get them to work together, Neil, to, or is that an important, I mean, let me ask you, is it important, first of all, and if so, how do we get them to work together? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely crucial for the economy and for the future of the next generation. And so you're absolutely right. I think that for, for a long time, there's been not so much a standoff, but I think a lack of understanding of drivers, whether they're funding drivers, economic drivers, pace of change that's happening, particularly digitally, and the agility of the system to be able to deliver to the pace that um, companies are having to respond to. But I think, again, going back to the white paper, the local um, employee and employment improvement plans and looking at you know, requiring skills providers, colleges, training providers to work locally with employer uh, bodies, whether that's local chamber of commerce, for example, I think really getting into a granular discussion around local labour markets, defining those locally, and back to my point on inward investment, being part of a conversation that says, you know, we want to be famous in Manchester for say digital skills. And so what are we all going to do as the employer bodies, employers, uh, colleges, institutes of technology, universities, what are we going to do together to make sure we're developing the high quality skills um, that those investors need to create jobs for today and tomorrow? And I think that more um, local or regional conversation, which is much more joined up, which again is being incentivized and motivated through the white paper, I think is really, really important because it creates a framework which other countries have. You know, when, when we look across world scales and look at, you know, people famously talk about what's happening in Germany and the social partnership model. But if you look at what's happening in Singapore and you look at how, you know, the, the government convenes and then local um, partners are convened to discuss these issues because they're economically important and they're about, you know, being clear about what um, the country, whichever country in the world it is, what they want to be you know, famous for, or what they want to be known for to attract that investment. And if it's digital in the UK, then we need to convene everybody around that. And, and I think the white paper is a fantastic opportunity for getting people locally and regionally to be able to do that and get employers and training providers and colleges all on the same agenda and talking the same talk about how to make sure we're creating more high quality jobs um, for the next generation and particularly in digital, if that's where the growth is going to be. I'm going to, as it were, almost abuse my position as moderator, but I've been an advisor for a number of years on a European project called the Intelligent Cities Challenge. And what we've learned is you have to bring all the actors, the local authorities, the academics, the business community and citizen, you know, citizen bodies. And where you get those four working to a common aim, then that's where the magic happens. And that the... the um, the, the work you've done with apprentices, you know, must have taught us a lot about this. I mean, you have to have, clearly, the very nature of it is employers have to be engaged with this. I mean, what, what are the learnings from the apprenticeship programme? Uh, are there some that are broadly applicable? I think just picking up on what you've been speaking about in terms of having everyone working together and collaboratively is one of the really sort of key things. If you take what we're trying to do now and the fact that employer trailblazers have come together, hundreds of them now, to develop new apprenticeship standards and really change the face of apprenticeships. 
But where they've really worked well is where the employers have come together with training providers, with assessment organisations, learning from the process and, and, and actually being able to develop something powerfully because they have got that collaboration. And also now bringing in the, the apprentices themselves. So I think in terms of if we look at any programme, making sure those learners are involved as well is important. But, um, you know, we learned so much through the pandemic around the apprenticeship side of things and uh, across um, a number of different areas and skills development and what can be done and what can be achieved. So, um, you know, with the apprenticeships, I think there was a, a feeling when the pandemic started, could we actually, what was going to happen and how would it continue? But people have been able to continue their learning online. They've been assessed and completed endpoint assessments. We had um, the essential digital skills come on board and then that started. T levels are still continuing. You know, it, it, things can keep going. And I think we've learned that there's a you know, we can, there's so much that can be done. And it's not only coming from BCS, I'll say it's the technology is a very important bit. But a lot of this has been how people have worked together. And that going back to that collaboration piece, an absolute you know, determination to, to draw together and make things work. And I think if we can still continue having that approach as we move forward with the plans in the white paper, that's going to be really critical. So, you know, I think that's one thing. One, the other thing I would say in terms of how is it working for um, getting this out to people is the sort of communication that's needed around it. I think there's so much that is particularly so good for um, people and businesses to take part in. It's just how we communicate that and get it out so people can choose, make the right choices, select the right option for them, because there, there's a, a number of different opportunities in the, in the government's white paper and what will come out in terms of um, incentives, but also in the amount of choice that um, people can get involved in, whether it be the different types of apprenticeships, different you know, T levels that are out, and now there's going to be higher level technical qualifications, it's making sense of what, what's the right thing and the right choice for individuals and businesses. So it's the danger of us all being sweetness and light here and there. I mean, what, what, what are the real on the ground challenges that we've had to overcome to make this happen? You know, what, where, where have we had to, I don't know, bang heads together or where, where have the difficulties been in getting employers and providers to work together? Okay, I, I, you know, I don't, think there's a huge difficulty in all honesty with employers and providers working together. I think we've seen some fantastic examples of that happening. I think it's um, to do with making sure that things are fit for purpose and um, available. So if we're going to have the opportunity to do different qualifications, that there's the right qualifications and fit for purpose choices available to people. Um, it's also looking at the, you know, it's mentioned in the white paper about the approach to modularized training. And that's so important because actually if people, adults are going to go back to training, they need to have something that's going to fit with their, their life. So those barriers are sometimes you might have something that's available, but is it practical and is it fit for purpose? So that's a really important piece, that flexibility. And also it's around you know, making sure that there is suitable funding and that there's flexibility around how that funding is applied. And again, the white paper addresses the allocation of funding, which is important to make sure, you know, we've talked about the local need. And I think the local part to me is the, is the gem here because actually if we really get down to the critical priorities in local areas and apply the funding in the right way, and they have flexible, robust training that can support that local agenda, that is what's going to be really important. So, you know, these are not barriers that can't be overcome, but they're very important that we get each bit right. And if you take funding recently, we were very, very pleased, thank you, Gillian, that we have the same funding bands for apprenticeships for digital um, standards. You know, it, it needs to have that investment and, and have it applied in the right way. So that's the type of challenge that we need to be addressing. But, you know, we if we want to look at positive examples of providers working with employers very, very effectively, there are lots out there. And I know there'll be some listening on this um, call. And can I turn to the topic of what we might broadly call careers advice? I mean, but perhaps um, broaden the topic a bit. Uh, at, uh, at the Institute, we've been doing some work on what is a data scientist and working with other bodies. 
because it's it's not always obvious. I mean, one of the things, Neil, we we identified, um, I think, 12 or so different case studies of this person's a data sign, this person's a data. Do you think employers need to do more to describe what these digital opportunities are? Um, and how, you know, how do we do that in a, how do we do that in this sort of fast changing world? Gillian, is this, I mean, is this something you, would this be a call to employers? Be clear about what the jobs are, or do you think we're being clear enough? No, no, I think we do need to be clearer. And also, I think I, the worst question you can get asked at any age as a teenager is what do you want to do? I still remember myself and you think, God, I have to come up with something. And I actually, you know, the honest answer is I haven't a clue. And it's even more difficult now than it was because it, at least I had more of an understanding of the jobs landscape, what was out there. It's all changed yeah. so quickly that I don't think there's anybody that has a real good understanding of the, just the absolute breadth of what is a data scientist, how it applies to different industries. And people are out of date um, misconceptions yeah. and preconceptions either about industries or about jobs. Um, so I think this is a really vital point. And all of them, by the way, the way we list, I, I've been looking through a lot of it. A lot of it sounds, you know, you don't know what it is, really. It sounds a little bit uh, opaque. It's kind of, it, it's something that it's, it's, not, it's not easy to imagine yourself in when you're a 14, 12, 14, 14, 15 year old, you know, when you're making these vital decisions about, you know, your pathways. So that's one of the reasons why careers is a big pillar of the white paper. And it's one of the reasons why we've said we really do have to set up these uh, careers hubs, these national careers hubs so that every young person from the age of 12 hopefully uh, or 11 12 can start to interact with these businesses and start to see for themselves what kind of careers there are the honest answer to most young people's question of what do you want to be was i don't mind i'll be as long as i can you know do something fun and interesting learn progress earn decent money travel a bit that's normally up there you know, I, I don't really mind which sector. I don't really mind what kind of roles. I'm open, really, to ideas. And if we all think about our own careers journey, we've actually all probably taken careers that have just been, we've been open to ideas and they've just kind of appeared before us. And we've taken that opportunity. And then, you know, we've taken another one. And then, you know, that's how, that's how careers are. Yeah. And of course, we will all have two, three, four. I mean, this is obviously my second career, very different from the one before, but we'll all have many, many different careers as well. And that ability, that's again, a culture change, which, you know, young people, I think in their heads, they're already embracing that, but how they get the hooks into the starting, which is why things like T-levels are vitally important because yeah. you get this nine week work experience, having those career opportunities to interact. Apprenticeships, I did an apprenticeship. I did a, a degree level apprenticeship. I still think they're a fantastic way to navigate your way around what yeah. type of jobs are available because you see them you see all the different jobs and you know you're not pigeonholed really into one you can move around from from the starting position so I guess I, I, I think it is really vitally important um, but I think that hopefully those that, that will really just blow people's minds about the, the number of options you have and then of course what we need to do is make sure that the parity of all the different routes are more equal uh, and of course we know that technical jobs you know you earn more right we know that you earn more so just making sure that people are making the choices on the right information is important and when people look to go back and invest in themselves later on again they have really good information that enables them to look at where the vacancies are in their area what kind of careers there are how you get from here to there and what support is available to help you on your journey Neil we you touched, I think, uh, earlier on a couple of international comparisons. Um, and of course, we've long looked at Germany and the sort of Fraunhofer models and, you know, and all those things. And, and, and latterly, um, Asia, Singapore, Malaysia and, uh, and so on. But trying to ignore those for a moment. <laughs> are, are the, you know, in your international learnings, are there other things that you think we should be picking up on that are you know, maybe in addition to those somewhat... You know, we've been around the block on those. Are, what, are there any new learnings internationally? Yeah, so you know, yeah, so World Skills is a global organisation. We're in over eighty-six countries, and what we find at World Skills UK, when you start looking to learn 
from a benchmarking perspective and think well, what can we learn from other countries world skills is all about young people achieving world-class standards so global industry standards and so we train them to do that from a from a uk perspective we train team uk and they go off and compete with the rest of the world and so you get an immediate benchmarking sort of where are we on digital skills compared with so the Far East? So the UK has been ninth in the benchmarking, so the medal tables, and we're setting a target to be in the top five over the next few years um, to up the ante. In order to do that, you have to learn from the people that are above you yeah. in the medal table, literally. Yeah. So we are um, we are setting up um, global partnerships. So we are formal partnerships. We signed with Taiwan last week and Korea. We'll be signing up with Japan, uh, Russia, um, Brazil. All of these countries have um, implemented skills reforms um, to a large extent, which is all based on the standards that are set at World Skills, and they've implemented those. So what we're doing as well as learning from how they train young people is how they test and assess. And so a, a lot of that is what we're doing through these partnerships is learning from them about their training standards, how they go about setting curriculum and how they assess young people and the pressure under which you, you know, put young people to pressure testing them to make sure they've not just got the technical skill set, but as Gillian was saying earlier, the confidence, the mindset to be able to succeed and understand that you know, they need to be confident as well as technically good. And that's what a lot of our training program for young people to be able to compete internationally is all about building their confidence to be able to do that. And so what we um, have done is in you know, looking at what other countries have done, we've set up a centre of excellence um, supported by an awarding body in the UK, NCFE, and supported by the department, which is looking at turning the learnings from what other countries do and mainstreaming it into colleges and training providers and so we package it up as our own sort of curriculum knowledge transfer to get into yeah. the system to drive at a point uh, which is underlying all a lot of these issues whether it's parental concerns about understanding what's going on young people's concern employers concern which is quality and you know is this a high quality offer offering high quality skills which will turn into a, a rewarding career and what we believe is by looking at what other countries are doing and those that are you know achieving higher standards of skills than us that we've got a huge amount to learn and we want to grow our capacity to be able to bring that learning back into our economy via the skills system. And you know, this digital research that we did recently was all about really thinking it. So where are we, what's the need? And then what can we do as World Skills UK to make sure we're focusing and transferring learnings from other countries in the world to do this? Because you know, young people get this, you know, they know they yeah. live in digital worlds, what Gillian said earlier, you know, we're, we're just living digitally, they're digital natives. And, you know, a lot of the competitions program that we see, there's more and more demand for things like um, digital media production, 3D games, art design, graphic design, web design. You know, these are all specific digital career pathways that young people are interested in. T-levels will help support all of those. But we've just got to make sure we're getting the right quality, I think, so that young people and, and their parents understand they're getting a high quality education that will lead to high quality jobs at the end of the day. And all of that, back to my starting point, it's important for then inward investors to come in and invest and create those jobs yeah. all across the UK so that we're more productive yeah. and competitive. And that's what other countries they see in world skills doing. They, you know, they're mainstreaming all this global industry standards into their system and driving up standards in that way. And that's what, you know, we, we're working with the department to do as well. Gillian, you talked about culture change earlier. I mean, do you think we need to do, are we doing enough to get the digitally excluded, um, whether that's through digital poverty of one form or another, or simply because they're from an ethnic or gender background that you know maybe there's a little bit of a hurdle that they have to step over in order to take advantage of some of the things Neil had been talking about. Are we doing enough to try and change the culture in those hard to reach sectors of the uh, society? Well, I don't think you can ever say you're doing enough when you've got such a, a, a yeah. big gap, you know, in terms of yeah. people who still need those skills. I mean, I, I think the question is, you know, are, have you got uh, enough provision in a different ways 
different avenues to try and reach the people to what you're talking about is really lowering the barriers to engagement and re-engagement with the within the education system and you know enabling people to gain their confidence uh, from probably very low levels in this world to you know to, 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 to try and gain their confidence so we did introduce obviously in August last year a basic digital entitlement and I think that's I think that's that's good, you know, we've, we've got that, it's high quality. Uh, we've gone through all of the, um, you know, the, the digital training that we have and we've made sure that it's, it's refreshed really. Um, obviously launching something in August, 2020, based on the year we've had, if you don't already have the digital skills, I mean, obviously we had the skills toolkit yeah. that was there as well, which has, you know, some very sort of entry level kind of uh, ways to build your skills. But if you really start with none, you're not gonna start off, you know, access. Yeah skills toolkit so i think we've got those things to build upon obviously we've all learned an awful lot in terms of um uh, digital and, and even getting teachers and lecturers yeah. very quickly to a point where they can they can impart knowledge digitally and engage digitally all that's happened overnight i often say to college lecturers if we'd have asked you to do that it would have taken years yeah a decade the fact there was no choice it just yeah. it just happened and there's some lots there's lots that we will really gain i mean gosh it's been a painful experience but there will be some gains that we've had uh, as a result of it so i think we'll have a lot to learn a lot to still continue to develop and a lot to actually implement fully and make sure everybody's fully aware of it that you know we've only just introduced um but we won't stop working on it working with you know people like yourselves and we've been working with lots and lots of other people in industry who look at this you know lloyds and others that look at this in, in great detail um until we get to the point where people can and feel confident to digitally engage i think the pandemic's probably helped a lot you know even my parents in their 70s you know they've they've been zooming all the way through i mean i haven't yeah. seen their feet and their nostrils but still you know, they're they're part way, despite the fact I bought them a stand, but still that's uh, that's not something that they can't fight over the stand, I don't think. But, you know, everybody has had to get used to this. You go into hospitals, you'll see patients, you know, in hospital. It's the only thing. So in a way, maybe that fear factor has gone down and we've got a big opportunity yeah. to make a massive difference now. So there's a much more probably of a, a need, but hopefully um, fear factor has gone down and we just need to make sure we've got all those routes in place to pick people up uh, when they're ready to learn. Annette, any observations from you on, you know, from the across the BCS learnings on um, how we reach those harder to reach parts of society uh, for, for one reason or another? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we've talked about the hard to reach bits of society and also we haven't mentioned the SMEs because I think in terms of building back better um, that's another area that we need to focus on and you know I, I've already mentioned the, the local agenda and I think that's one of the ways that we can do because actually if we start um, working on a more a localized basis and working with the appropriate partners that that's one way to do it but also there's I think in, in um, implementing the stuff in the white paper and doing what we're doing we need to build on what's already there there are so many very good groups and skills local skills boards and obviously the iot's and and it's about how we work together to sort of say right what's there already what can we build upon and really get some action to address the the challenges be it on a local level or on a national level so you know i think that that's probably a key to it and some of the uh, I think we've talked about this is sort of linked to it, but getting over the perception that's been mentioned already, that, that sort of really, we, we quite often talk on these types of um, meetings and events about, we come back to the perception of um, this a, a technical education. So actually, as we're doing these challenging things and hard to reach um, audiences, actually how we put across what the opportunity is, is so important because, We've got a great opportunity here and we can't keep having this conversation about parity we've got to take it and grasp it and do it this time mm -hmm. and also along with parity is the diversity piece we know you know apprenticeship take up it across all digital standards we've probably got about 20 well we know we have 25 percent females um, in the majority of standards a little bit higher in, in some of the areas but we've, you know, it, we've got to look at how do we actually put the, these exciting opportunities across. And again, 
you know, I, I came from hospitality, as you just said. To me, um, IT was IT when I was in hospitality. Come into this world and you realize all these amazing different occupations. So we've got a big job to do to get, you know, really inspire, take out what these opportunities are. And they're not going to change. They're just going to get more exciting and more interesting because as digital develops. So I think it's not it, it, as we crack those difficult um, nuts and, you know, really try and take this forward, doing everything we can to really put across what the um, opportunities are, not only in terms of the incentives, but as this fantastic career that people can progress in. Absolutely. I think, I think, so I think yeah. on the diversity point, there's a, there's a huge amount of work I think employers can do um, in, in being really explicit that they want to be an inclusive employer. Yeah. And lots of you know, big employers and small and medium sized employers are doing a lot of good work on being gender inclusive, or race inclusive, or LGBT inclusive. And so them being very explicit about that and taking that into their recruitment of apprenticeships. I think that's, so sometimes you talk to employers that will do all that and say, do, are you explicit in saying to young people, yeah. you know, that that's what you want? Because a lot, we've done some previous research around, you know, employers say, you know, are, you, are you young people ready for work? And what young people are saying, are you ready for us? Are you young people ready? Because we've got different views, different expectations, you know, this, this is what we're expecting yeah. from an employer in terms of being an inclusive workplace. And I think that often doesn't get, you know, melded together yeah. in terms of how companies think about recruitment. It's the first thing. But the second thing is, um, young woman that we've worked with, young Asian woman at Chagui Rolanda, you know, she said something to me a couple of years ago, you can't be what you can't see. And there's a huge amount of work for organisations like us and others, maybe working with you, to actually profile and showcase young people and others who do come from a range of backgrounds, whether it's race or whether it's gender, whether it's sexual orientation, whatever it is, and just talking about, you know, I'm doing this apprenticeship or I'm following this technical education pathway um, and, you know, and I'm successful and this is great and because what we found from our research was I think something like three quarters of young people um, in environments where they're listening to other young people really respond really well because you're just talking to somebody who's in your age range and, yeah, gets it, and they talk like you and they look like you yeah. and you know there's for sure there's a role for employers today yeah. but there's also a role I think for peer role modeling as well and that's yeah. that's increasingly what we do at World Skills UK is provide you know, digital platforms and for young people to tell their stories and tell other young people their stories so that it feels real. I, I was talking to the guys in BCS who run a group on diversity and inclusion, you know, member group, and they were telling me they've mapped a hundred different grassroots groups focusing on diversity in tech and are attempting to sort of bring sort of some coalescence to it. Um, Claire, let me turn to you. How, is, is our discussion pleasing this audience? Are we miles off the mark? I mean, what are people saying? What are the questions that are coming in? Pick one or two out for us. Yeah, I think overall people are, are responding quite well to, to the, uh, the webinar itself. Uh, there's been quite a, um, quite a few questions that have been put in. I'll just give you a sample of these. So uh, Lee Chadwick, to assist the building of skills for use in the digital sector, is it possible to be more flexible with regards to the work placement nature quota on the T levels, particularly bearing in mind that digital is very good remote as well as on site, but many arranged placements were lost due to the health emergency. I think that's, that's one for, for Gillian there. Um, another anonymous attendee said, I don't think you can just look at apprenticeships as part of solving a national skills gap. The pandemic has turned many aspects of life on its head where digital skills can, in theory, be sourced from anywhere. Um, this one from anonymous attendee. Hi, panel. I've not I've been uh, not been employed since September 2020. I work in financial services and am a qualified mortgage advisor. I'm quite currently 55, but unable to get a job. I want to upskill myself within the digital market. Is it too late for me? He asks. I mean, no. I think is the answer to that one. Definitely not. Uh, no, no question. It's definitely not too late. I mean, what? Anybody else got a view on that last question? 50 yeah, I do. I mean, I was 52 when I became a minister, so yeah. 55 definitely isn't too late. Um, How old is Joe Biden? Oh, uh, God, yeah. he's 78. 78, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it, the question is, um, uh, you know, how, how, how we're going to 
provide access yeah. to retraining for Pat. And, that, and, you know, that's why the lifetime skills guarantees this a recent announcement. Obviously, half of our apprenticeships actually are uh, taken up by adults, which is something I think there's been five million apprenticeships more or less since 2010, half of which have been adults and half of which have been young people, half men, half women. Obviously, there'll be occupational sector uh, differences as well. Um, but also, I think one of the things I'm really excited about in the, in the new skills system, as well as the lifetime skills guarantee, which is full time courses between 12 weeks and, and, and a couple of years, actually, which are now freely available if you don't already have a level equivalent but it's the skills boot camps as well which we've now started to roll out a lot of the early ones were in digital coding cyber security um, and data analytics and various specific jobs and it looks like they're going to be a very successful way a 12 to 16 week focused um, boot camp quite intensive training now if pat goes and looks around locally may or may not find one there at the moment there have been six areas that have been trialed and we're going to be rolling them out in the coming months to more areas and there'll be a, hopefully a continued feature as long as they're successful but they're the kind of things to, to, to look out for uh, take a look at the skills toolkit just for now if you want to play around in your own time and see because um, you can even do a seven, 70 hour I think it is python training course in your own bedroom just see how you get on nobody's watching um, and so I think there's a, there's a couple of things that you can probably try uh, on there as well um, but I, whilst I've got the floor, if I answer the other yeah, questions, T-level work placement, um, this has been a couple of people have, have raised this. And, and actually, it sort of links to the second question about this concept that if digital skills, if they are just this remote digital kind of box that you ask someone to, to do something and then it comes back, um, then actually they can be sourced from anywhere. And some elements of the roles could be like that and have been actually over time you know there's been a big outsourcing that's been facilitated by many of that kind of practice whether it's encoding or uh, customer service or many many other areas but to me i think this you know what is it that's going to differentiate our country and i say this to the universities as well if it was a complete online experience i'd choose to go to harvard every time because it would be, you know, if I could go there, I could pay the money, get the badge. It was all online. I didn't have to move. I didn't have the cost of moving. I could stay in my own place. You've got to think about what is it that's going to differentiate as well. And where, where, where are we looking to differentiate? So I've been very keen that, to me, the T-level work placement isn't sat in your bedroom doing a piece of work that's a project called whatever it's called. It's that whole sliding doors moment that happens when you work, you walk into the workplace, you put a suit on for the first time or whatever it is that, you know, maybe it's not a suit, maybe it's whatever people wear, but work appropriate stuff. You go in and you learn from people around you. You learn from other people, other people's experiences, how they got there. And, you know, maybe it's because I, you know, come from a working class background. I left school at 16 and my chance was given when I went through this sliding door through a, 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 as an apprentice. But I still very much remember, you know, nearly 40 years later, walking into that factory on the first day and all of that, all of that other stuff that I learned in the first couple of months of my apprenticeship. And that is what we want to get from a T-level. It isn't just about this part of it, it's, it's, it's asking people about the, all the careers, it's building the network. So I've been very keen, and mostly I've been very keen because I've met loads of T-level students who say to me, please, please, please do not keep me in my bedroom. I want to be able to go in and talk to people and get a real experience talking to people. Uh, so that's where that really comes from and that desire. And I guess this is all part of this culture change that we've got to, we've really got to challenge ourselves to do. Because if we can't work together to enable a skills pipeline to be built with nine week work placements, careers, careers interactions, nine week work placements, more serious uh, long term apprenticeships and all the other things that we've got, whether it's kickstart, if we can't work together to to really get those opportunities, then it's going to be very difficult for that culture shift to happen. And our differentiation I used to get I went back to London Business School in I don't know about 10 years ago less than 10 years ago and somebody said to me how are we ever going to compete how are our young people ever going to compete you've got all these countries in Asia they're like mathematical geniuses and they're doing all this stuff and you know how are our young people ever going to be able to get a job and I said because you know they they, they will have other ingenuity as well they'll be brilliant at 
certain things but it's that blend of skills it's that those people skills as well and business skills as well as the technical skills and you really build those skills when you're in a workplace learning not just from tutors not from just from your tutor over there but from tons and tons of people around you so I feel that this is going to be a big discussion about you know what is the future of work what does it look like what's the blend of work and what does it look like post the pandemic and there's all sorts of different theories on that but I do believe um, that if we don't have some elements of the workplace in terms of that physical workplace young people who have not built that social capital will really struggle to really be um, as brilliant as I know they will be. Annette any comments from from you on those questions? I mean, I can, first of all, in terms of is it too late? Absolutely not, because as, as Red Gillian's already covered all of that, but um, just to, to add to that, I suppose in, in terms of the, um, you know, how work placements are done, and I totally can see who wants to be in their bedroom when you're young, sitting in front of a screen all the time. We, who wants to do it when you're not young? We all want to be out. I, I suppose we need to start thinking um, how we're going to address some of those challenges because what work, the workplace looks like is going to be different. And then there's lots of examples of um, people who are going to work in a blended, taking a blended approach, part office, part at home. And also I was talking actually to a friend recently. He runs a, a small business. There's, I don't know, six, seven directors. They've got a fantastic tech business, but they don't have an office. So when I said to him, why haven't you got an apprentice? Because I ask everyone that when I meet them, you know, he said, well, we can't because we don't have a physical workplace. So I suppose we're going to start have to think creatively so that people, young people do have that experience. Because totally agree with Julian. They, you know, it's really important having those people skills, work skills and being in the workplace. But also, how can we use creative technology and innovative technology to say, well, when actually smaller businesses can't manage that, what can be done? And obviously, there's the flexible apprenticeships, not quite sort of based on that, but what could be done around that? So I think working around all these things, we need to come to, to solutions that are really going to be fit for purpose for the individual and the businesses that are employing these people as well. I wonder, Annette, whether this is, we haven't really touched on this, the regional and local agenda I mean I worked in Brussels for a few years and one so everybody works in their own little offices or at the moment in, in their bedrooms I, I think what they most miss a Thursday night in Plus Luxembourg when all the youngsters come out uh, you know and that's you know that's when they do and it, a lot of it is talking about work but it's yeah. over a couple of beers and they get you know there are different ways of engaging um, with other people face to face other than having to go into the factory as it were maybe these models will emerge places where you get together for a Thursday afternoon tea or so or whatever I don't know I, mean. I think so and and really Neil you've mentioned that looking at the the international um sort of benchmarking and um what's happening wider than just in the UK and that's what we need to do think think wide and and make sure that we can yeah. find solutions to fit different needs yeah, because I think with the, with the young people in particular in this whole blended solution, I think there is a huge opportunity in Stillian's point about Harvard. Actually, we've been, um, you know, having some young Brits, you know, competing with their counterparts in China. You know, 30 countries we have on an IT competition um, a couple of weeks ago. And that experience for them, they just, you know, you're not going to get that in a sort of an old world sort of scenario. So, you know, we've got to, you know, take the opportunities to give young people and others the you know, the experiences that you can online, because now we accept them all as valuable and valued experiences, and then blend that with the face-to-face. -face. And I think the more we can do that and open our minds, whether it's a networking approach, John, that you're talking about, and getting young people to network online as well, nationally and internationally, I think these are all opportunities for us to create a platform, which is moving, you know, the careers agenda, the skills agenda forward. And I think you know, the opportunities are massive, and we're only really, yeah. I think still yeah. starting to think as we're processing everything that's happened over the past year, we're only really still starting to see those opportunities come through, but it's massive. We, so it's our last minute, and Gillian, let me turn to you for that last minute. I, the, the thing that really struck me at the beginning was your point about the timing. We have been around this block for a long time. We've talked about these issues, but to some extent, the pandemic has really brought home to us the, the timing. So well, well done for grasping, grasping the nettle right now. And, you know, an all party up. So in that last minute, what do you want us to do? What What's our, your last message to us? How can we help? 
Um, well, you can only have an employer-led system with leadership from employers. So my biggest challenge, and, and by the way, having worked in business for many years, I had zero, nothing ever to do with the DFE or ESFA or any of that. So, and I never would have thought of it. I'd be solving my own skills gaps and trying to actually usually by trying to either, you know, get them from our own um, training um, yeah. that we invested in or, um, you know, obviously get them from, from other, um, other countries or other companies. So I, and, and there's going to be, that's going to be a very difficult route. It's, it's obviously a route that companies will use as well, but it's going to be a very difficult route because everybody's going to be trying that at the same time. So I think the really, really important thing is now's the right time to engage in the system. And, you know, we, we're going to make it very, as much, as easy as we can to make it, more natural to work with government on solving these but we really do need employers to be curious about you know what is their role in this how can i've never met an employer that wants low skills they want high quality skills they want much high quality skills every time we look and think you spent 18 years in the, in the education system why don't you know this this and this so bringing those things together is just going to be great for the individuals great for companies great for, for our productivity, great for our economic recovery. And, 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 you know, having that focus, but what we really do need uh, is going to be employer leadership uh, to work with us so that we can actually deliver it. It's not easy to deliver. I don't underestimate the challenge. And the first time, talk about timing, the first time somebody did a technical education commission in this country was in 1884. So uh, this is a historic opportunity to make a difference. Well, uh, with that, let me thank you for joining us. Annette, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Neil, really nice to see you again, and thank you for taking the time out. And Minister, thank you very much for your time, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're right behind you in this well-timed push to bridge that digital skills gap. And thank you all for attending. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.